This is a story of the inconvenient truth. Antarctica, the world's mega freezer is melting. Greenland, Iceland, and all of the North Pole are defrosting at the fastest rate in recorded history. Trillions of gallons of water, which were once ice, are now flooding the world's oceans. That, coupled with thermal expansion due to increased surface temperatures, is causing the world's oceans to rise significantly. This impending yet slow onset catastrophe will significantly affect small island developing states like St. Lucia. Wait, let's correct that. The effects of sea level rise are already impacting St. Lucia and there is nothing we can do to slow it or solve it. Our population centers have the coast. They are all at risk. This documentary will examine the socio-economic impact of a one-meter rise in sea level as it threatens to take St. Lucia or Baglo. Ancillary, Viewfort, the city of Castries and in particular, Denry South all lay helplessly awaiting Mother Nature's inevitable assault. As waves near the shock cemetery terrorize the dead, a hopeless excavator tries to prevent the inevitable. And this isn't a tropical storm, trough, or depression. This is happening without warning and with disturbing frequency. And sadly, it is happening all over the planet. Tonight, disaster in Puerto Rico. Wildfires have been searing away parts of Argentina's northeastern province of Corrientes, brought on by drought and high temperatures. Summer 2022 has featured one climate-related disaster after another. 32 million Americans remain under heat alerts. Extreme heat is gripping large parts of India and Pakistan. While monsoon flooding left about one third of Pakistan underwater, affecting an estimated 33 million people. The Asian heat helped to melt some glaciers in the Himalayas, elevating rivers. Consequently, three times the normal annual rain fell in Pakistan during a week-long monsoon. More than 1,500 people died in the flooding. An estimated 1.8 million homes were damaged or destroyed, and hundreds of thousands of livestock lost food for the upcoming season will be in short supply. Extreme heat in Europe led to wildfires, especially in Spain and Portugal. The drought in Spain dried up a reservoir, revealing the long-submerged Spanish stone hedge, an ancient circle of megalithic stone believed to date back to around 5000 BC. Electricity generation in France plummeted, with low rivers reducing the ability to cool nuclear power towers and German barges had difficulty finding enough water to navigate the Rhine River. In the United States, the West and Midwest suffered through intense heat waves, and the crucial Colorado River reservoirs, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, hit record lows, triggering water restrictions. Yet, the country also saw major disruptive flooding in several cities and regions, from Death Valley to the mountains of eastern Kentucky. In China, heat waves and drought stretched over eight weeks and dried up parts of the Yangtze River to the lowest level since at least 1865, until parts of the same area were inundated with flooding rains in August. Climate change, for the most part, does not directly cause the rainfall or drought but it makes these natural occurring events more intense and severe. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, largely from power plants, vehicles, buildings, industry and agriculture, trap heat in the atmosphere, heating the planet. In addition to rising temperatures, global warming increases evaporation of surface waters into the atmosphere, drying areas that have had little rain. Warmer air increases the amount of water vapor the atmosphere can hold, and the thirstier atmosphere sucks moisture from the surface. That extra moisture is carried away by winds and eventually flows into storms. 
atmospheric moisture has increased by 5% to 20% in general compared to the pre-1970s. The increase in water vapor, a greenhouse gas, further amplifies warming. When water evaporates, it absorbs heat, and when it later falls as rain, the heat is released into the atmosphere. This extra energy fuels storms, leading to more intense systems that may also be bigger and last longer, with up to 30% more rain as a consequence of warming. The worry is that these kinds of extreme climatic events will become normal occurrences. Children born today are seven times more likely to face extreme weather than their grandparents. And whereas droughts, storms and heat waves announce their presence, the world is experiencing a slow onset, irreversible climate catastrophe called sea level rise. So sea level rise really speaks about the gradual increase in the height of our ocean because of factors. Those factors, as you ask, there are two of them really. The one, there's something that we call thermal expansion. And when water is heated, it expands. So as the temperatures increase because of global warming, because of all these greenhouse gases that we're putting out into the atmosphere, and they're forming this layer across around our planet that's preventing heat from escaping. So you have really hot days like today becoming much more frequent. Um, that causes the oceans to warm up. So it's not just the land that's warming up, but the oceans are also warming up. As the oceans warm, as water warms, water expands. So as water expands, it gets higher. But the other thing that's contributing to sea level rise is the melting of our ice caps, the melting of the glaciers. You know, we have two areas on our planet where you have a lot of ice, the North Pole and the South Pole. Now, what we found, what the scientists have found, is that the increase in temperature is not uniform across the planet. On the North Pole and the South Pole, the temperatures are increasing faster than the increasing uh, as the average across the planet. So it means that all these glaciers and, you know, when people take these cruises to Alaska and they see these beautiful glaciers, they're melting. And you see the pictures of these glaciers just falling off into the, into the ocean. As they melt, that what was ice before is now becoming water. So as that water gets into the ocean, as that ice melts and gets into the ocean, again, what will happen? Your sea levels rise. Global sea levels have risen 8 to 9 inches since reliable record keeping began in 1880 and is projected to rise another 1 to 8 feet by 2100. The magnitude of the rise will depend strongly on the rate of future carbon dioxide emissions and future global warming, and the speed might increasingly depend on the rate of glaciers and ice sheet melting. 40% of the world's population live within 100 kilometers of the coast, meaning that close to 3 billion people could be impacted by changes in sea level. We are island people. Most of our infrastructure, most of our houses, most of our economic activity, a lot of our social activity occurs around the coast. In fact, before the advent of airplanes and airports, we use ships to go around. So that's why we built our communities on the coast because it's a lot easier to, to move goods and, and people around. So if you now have your oceans getting, your, the levels are increasing, and that sea is encroaching further and further inland, it means now that you're disrupting activity. You now, people who live along the coast now have to retreat further and further inland. Activities that you had around your, uh, your coastline, um, be they schools, um, your ports, your air and sea ports, um, these now have to be relocated because again, you have the, the ocean encroaching. Um, or a lot of our economic activity. In fact, I think it's been estimated that over 25% of the population of the Caribbean lives around the coastline. And as much as six to 7% of that population is at serious risk from the impacts of sea level rise. And the other thing that you'll get from sea level rise is whenever you have a, a hurricane, a storm, if your oceans are already a little higher than they were before, and you have that storm coming with wind and storm surge, then you have a double whammy because you have oceans that are slightly higher and you now have winds that are pushing that water further. So the damage from storm surge will be a lot more than you had before as these oceans rise even more. If we're looking at tourism, uh, rightly or wrongly, has been the main economical foundation of St. Lucia. And tourism is typically strategically located uh, at coastal level. 
then the consequences of sea level rise for the tourism industry is devastating. Um, but not only that, we have very vulnerable, vulnerably located infrastructure and road networks that would also be compact, uh, compounded. You imagine the topographical three-dimensional map of St. Lucia sitting in water, and you were able to push that map down into the water so that the water would intrude on all sides of that map. You would quickly see within a foot, two foot, three feet of sea level rise, how much of an intrusion that would be on our coastal regions. Many of our hotel developers love to sell an, uh, an idea to the tourist that comes down to the Caribbean. You step out of your room and you curl your toes in the sand because the room is right on the sand. Well, these might very soon become overwater suites because if you're talking about a one meter sea level rise, some of these suites, some of these rooms that are right on the sand may actually be suites that are right over the water. So again, in your tourism development, both nationally for the country, but also individually, the, the investor who's looking to invest, where is the right place to locate my investment, my hotel, my condominiums? The increasing number of natural disasters accelerated by a changing climate, including the record number of billion dollar disasters that hit in 2017, and the cumulative course of these disasters are outpacing the insurance industry's ability to help big owners mitigate these risks. Research shows that in 2017, insurers paid out a record $135 billion globally for storm damage. Many real estate-specific reports predict that before rising waters literally engulf any specific property, the market would place them underwater in a financial sense. The changing number of extreme weather events, rise in seasonal flooding and increased damage of storm surge would lead to lower asset value, skyrocketing insurance premiums, and eventually make it challenging, if not impossible, to sell properties in the most impacted coastal areas. Eventually, the theory goes, the combination of rising insurance rates and risk would deter investors, especially the larger institutional ones, looking for long-term profit potential. The Grayson Urban Land Institute report found that commercial property values in affected areas by the costliest hurricanes decreased by almost 6% one year after the storm and by 10.5% two years after. A Harvard study of properties in lower-lying areas of Miami-Dade County from 2020 found that properties exposed to rising sea levels sell at about 7% discount compared to similar assets without climate-related risk exposure. If you had to explain to the average person living within three to five miles of the coast in St. Lucia, Jamaica, Barbados, what would you say to them would be the possible impact of a one meter rise on the socio-economic climate of their country? And that's a brilliant question because we have done a number, and I say we meaning the Caribbean Community Climate Change Center, which I represent, um, a number of CAP surveys. And one of the things we have found is that we are largely still speaking to ourselves. The average man still does not yet get it in terms of what climate change means for him or, or the average person, I should say. So there's a lot of work to be done in terms of building awareness, in terms of focusing the message, and in terms of preparing people for what is to come. Therefore, messaging and having that message targeted is important because to be foretold is to be forewarned. When we return, a road disappears in Denry, ancillary is threatened, and Osbert Rages speaks. Dream to empower people and
Lucia Development Bank supporting lending developing building SLDB You got surveillance cameras. Great! That means you got a front row seat to watch your house being robbed and there's nothing you can do about it. Prevention is better than capturing it happening to you. With Sentinel Security, you get 24-hour monitoring island-wide. We install surveillance cameras, intruder and fire alarms, and our rapid response vehicle is always on patrol to foil any attempts. Sentinel Security, keeping you safe since 1982. Call us today for a free security consultation and quote. Telephone 452-4242. It's a perfect time for parents. Introducing the new and delicious Marigo Bay Rum Creams, true St. Lucian flavor, available island-wide. Seas are predicted to rise a foot by 2050 regardless of how much carbon emissions we reduce. Why is this happening and what can be done to adapt? As humans continue to pour greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, oceans have tempered the effect. The world's seas have absorbed more than 90% of the heat from these gases, but it's taken a toll on our oceans. 2021 set a new record for ocean heating. Rising seas are one of those climate change effects. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, average sea levels have swelled over 8 inches above 1880, with about 3 of those inches gained in the last 25 years. Every year, the sea rises another 0.13 inches, and sea level rise is accelerated and projected to increase by a foot by 2050. That translates into as much sea level rise in the next 30 years as occurred over the last century. In St. Lucia, there is no record for long sea level rise data. However, there have been reports of marine flooding due to extreme sea levels in recent years, including Hurricane Lenny in 1999, which produced an estimated 6-meter storm surge Hurricane Dean in 2007 generated a powerful storm surge that damaged marine equipment and infrastructure in Castries Harbour and significantly impacted the Northern Tourism Resort area with 10.2 meters of storm surge. Back in 2007, um, Hurricane Dean um, 
we definitely experience the effects of um, storm surge at Port Castries, whereby um, the ferry terminal um, close to Fuasho, um, there was significant storm surge, and what it caused um, is that the flooring of the ferry terminal, um, because of the old Gabion basket structures that was beneath, um, when the sea level rose and the seas receded, it actually caused that flooring to, um, to collapse and there were quite a few voids that were created in the floor. Um, now because those structures um, are quite aged, um, back then what they used was Gabion baskets, um, which is basically a retaining structure, a gravity type retain retaining structure. Um, so what we had to do, we had to actually re-engineer a solution um, that would not cause significant um, disruption to the facility and its operations. So we had to design another type of structure that included um, a riprap material, um, boulders, about one ton boulders uh, in size, and we actually had to pack it with concrete um, to be able to keep it together. And that in itself um, created a, a resilient barrier to the effects of storm surge. In St. Lucia, Key economic infrastructure, including the airports, seaports, and fuel storage areas, all dot the coast, some on low-lying reclaimed land. Research shows that they are the unwitting guinea pigs to the impacts of sea level rise. The study that was done um, a few years ago, I think Carib Save, UNDP, and a few others did this impact of sea level rise on the Caribbean. The seaports right across the Caribbean would be significantly impacted. The airports are also impacted because again, you want to make that approach, um, the, the, the landing and takeoff for an airline as easy as possible. You know, you so an, an approach via sea where you come in and you land and you take off very easily, that means that has its drawbacks. It means again that many of your airports are located very close to the ocean. So sea level rise will wreak havoc on um, airports and seaports right across the Caribbean. And St. Lucia is no exception. I think the worst we've seen is that um, maybe it would have probably been Hurricane Thomas, I believe, um, where you had the, the sea actually came over across that, um, the road in front of the airport. And we had some serious flooding um, within the car park area. Um, for people that are aware of how the airport is configured at George Charles, um, the road at the entrance to the airport is actually a little higher than the actual front of the building. Um, but again, in a situation like that, um, what we have been trying to, to institute is what you call a, a forced drainage system. In other words, it's not, it's, 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 it's not going to be through natural gravity. Um, to get water out, um, but we will have to create um, what you call a retention pond or detention pond um, that would really have a stormwater pump. So it would be able to create an, a, a, an a artificial catchment. So when the water comes in, um, it will be able to avoid the flooding of the area and, and get the water out, but via a force means, a mechanical means, as opposed to natural means because of the, con the configuration, the topography. Um, we would not be in a position to, to um, get rid of those, those huge increases in stormwater runoff unless it is mechanically driven or forced out of the, uh, out of the airport compound. The Uranora International Airport Reconstruction provides an opportunity for sea level rise risk mitigation from its initial design. And um, the terminal building, the ground floor is actually raised um, some six feet or two meters above the existing ground elevation. Now, if sea level is expected to rise one meter, then we would have doubled um, the, the ground floor elevation um, in that new terminal structure, um, which would guarantee that we will not be facing a situation um, that would impact or heavily impact our, our new terminal. So you now we talk ports, we always say, okay, well, we're talking, um, Plus Carinage and we're talking UNO International, but you're also talking um, Marigo Bay and Rodney Bay. Those are, in, those are very important ports for our tourism industry. Yachting is a very significant part of our tourism sector. 
what happens to these sports as these sports get, get inundated with sea level rise. So, so sea level rise will be a significant disruptor, a negative disruptor to economic activity in the Caribbean, particularly in St. Lucia, um, and, and even more so for the tourism sector. Ancillary is a small fishing village on the northwest coast that is particularly vulnerable to this slow onset looming catastrophe. Having lived in the village all my life that a lot, the beach has, a part of the beach has been eroded and the sea is getting closer to the houses in the village. Because there were some structures that were, that were visible on the, on the seafront and these are, you can see them again, these are in the water. So even without the, the surge or the, the leveling sea rise, the village has been affected. The village of Denry is caught in a particular climate quagmire, boxed by the sea, threatened by a large river, while sitting helplessly in a perennial flood zone. The village of Denry really is a microcosm of climate change impacts on a small island developing state because in the village of Denry, you have people being impacted by everything. You have people being impacted by sea level rise. You have um, storm surges. Whenever you have heavy hurricanes, um, they are impacted by the storm surge. You have a serious flooding in, the, in, in, in Denry because of the rivers. Um, whenever there's landslides, Denry is cut off because you know the bad level is impacted. Think about one meter sea level rise. One meter is three feet. So think of that sea rising three feet above its present level and think of all of the communities, all of the people who live in Denry and who live in Ancillary, who are within that distance of that high water mark um, and how much they will be impacted. This here, the Tuvalu River, it, it, it is one of the points of flooding. This river comes all the way from um, um, Bois-Jolie and it floods. This here, we're in the middle of a flood flood area. How is this, how does sea level rise exacerbate this flooding? Well, here's one of the things we have. At a high tide, it gets really, really, really high. And it is not unusual to find that just at normal high tide, there's water all, all on the road. Yes. Just an ordinary day. Yeah. If, uh, was um, this something gradual or? It is gradual. Was it, it always a phenomenon? No, no. It got worse over the years. That is why, um, the, 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 the height of the bridge and things of that sort had to be increased over the years. But what we have seen is not just a gradual change, but a, a, a rapid change over the last, say, 15, 20 years. Now, in recognition of this, um, and as part of the early warning systems, we have a, a water gauge somewhere in the interior, but significantly a tight gauge was put in the, in the basin. And that gives the Met Office and Nemo a, 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 a better indicator of what is likely to happen based upon what the thing is. And then the primary question is, how does this constant flooding uh, and increased flooding affect life and lives and livelihoods? Well, here's one other thing about livelihoods and living. We adapt. We adapt to, to what is happening. Some Can somebody people, build a whole wall around the house right at the water's edge? Well, that is, their, that is their idea of mitigating. That is their idea of mitigating. It may not be very effective, but it is their idea of mitigating. A breakwater is a permanent structure constructed along the coast to protect against tides, currents, waves, and storm surge. As part of Denry's coastal management system, breakwaters were installed to minimize erosion and to protect the village. I watched him on the bed, knowing a man who has worked his entire life, can't afford the cost of his surgery or medication. Mom and I must sell barbecue tickets to help save his life. For less than $4 a day, the cost of a packet of gum, my dad could have been airlifted to get treatment. 
some adults can be so insensitive with their lack of foresight. Now, mom and I either have to watch him wither away or sell a whole lot more barbecue. Why? Because one person didn't care enough to plan. GTM Medical Insurance. Less than $4 a day for the greatest peace of mind anyone could ask for. Call us today, 458-6300. It's been a long day without you, my friend And I'll tell you all about it when I see you again I see you again oh, How can we not talk about family when family's all that we got? Everything I went through, you were standing there by my side And now you gon' be with me for the last ride Let the light guide your way Since 1963, our mandate has been to serve people. You know, farming people, fishing people, teaching people, police people, Schwazel people, Sufre and all their people, no matter where they are. And our people are here, ready to serve with a smile, professionalism and flexibility. If all that makes you think we're your kind of people, then we're ready to help you. Schwazel Cooperative Credit Union. We make lives better. Join us today. Telephone 459-3100 or 459-3119. Some 50 odd years ago, there was a road built by the owners of the property, Denry Factory. Um, they owned the lands here all the way up to Lakai. The Sugar Estate. Yes. The, by then it was, it was Banana Estate, um, run by the, the Bernard family. They built a road here um, so that they could get materials, stones and so on. That's around the same time that the other roads were built up here. and. Um, it was a clearly defined road, and there was a bit of, 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 of land on the, on the side. It was not built at, ex, the, at the, the edge ocean. of the ocean. And uh, all of us who are of that age can remember. Over the years, it has eroded bit by bit, and um, there's just this little edge there where, the, the, well, you wouldn't know if there was a road unless you had the, 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 the knowledge. We have seen that kind of erosion happening here, um, even all along the beach here. For the deterioration of this road, yeah. do you think that it happened over a three-year period, five-year period? No, no, no. Or was no, it just no. with it, the passage of time, these things deteriorate? What we have seen is not just a deterioration, it's the rate of acceleration, the rate. Yes. So we have seen, perhaps over the last 30 years, an increase in that rate of, um, of, of, of activity. So there is something that has caused that sudden increase in the rate of, of deterioration. And that is the concern here, because that came about in the early 2000s, and it was in recognition that um, there was the constant er um, erosion. Um, and it was threatening the houses. In this case, this private owner he didn't wait for, for, for this project. He actually put in um, this behind his property and the sea waves were there. Wow. That is why he felt the need to put this there. This and other things, I think, encouraged the government of the day in the early 
early um, 2000s to engage this project and where we had this here to stabilize and to mitigate and the breakwater to, to, slow, it to slow it down. That has worked. To, um, that has worked. Um, we've had some storm surge events and the yes, it went over, but this here slowed it down. So what we had was it hit in here and we just had a spill over. Imagine this breakwater being installed around more communities, Grosley, for example, Ancillary, Canaries, for example. These yeah. have been installed around more communities. In well, it will Canada. become a necessity. For example, um, especially the, the, the communities that are most exposed. Now, Mikud, Mikud Village, because of the surrounded, there's just this, you don't get the level of sea surge that you would get here. But I could imagine that they would get, when they do get sea surge, it's going to be, going to be serious. So you need that level of protection. Um, communities like Canaries, there's hardly a beach in Canaries in left. Yes, so you would need that kind of thing, ancillary to a certain extent. Grosile, I mean, although it is in the leeward side, but there are communities that would require that sort of activity. Um, incidentally, look at some of the hotel properties. They have engaged in their own private breakwater mm -hmm. to facilitate. Yes, they can afford that and it's their livelihood, so they're doing it. What do you do with Denry? If it continues to flood, if elevated sea levels result in greater frequencies of flooding events in the village, and it's decided at some point in time, we've got to relocate those persons. We've got to find the place to relocate them. Um, can we, and we've got to provide services. We need to ensure they've got utilities, they've got water, and that the same services that they enjoyed while they were in their original location, health, the policing, et cetera, et cetera, can be provided in the new, new, new location. What about their livelihoods? If their livelihoods were dependent on, for example, their proximity to the sea, for example, where they were, or to other land areas, and they are now removed, then maybe the cost of getting them to a point where they could uh, continue their livelihoods in the same location or find something else to do. So that's a big challenge. What I've seen over the last 30, 40 years is alarming. And it is affecting our community directly. Not only in terms of finance, not only in terms of livelihood, not only in terms of safety, but psychologically. There are some persons within this community, if it rains too much, they can't fall asleep because they are psychologically traumatized by the last, they were traumatized by the last event and they are traumatized as to the next event. So we need, this is not asking for asking sake, it's asking because it is a need, it's a threat. And our very existence depends on it. So this is not, we're not playing games here. We're not, we're not into this PR thing. This is reality. No cattle don't put it in the bin. We're going to make compost. Not everything is meant to be thrown away. Even the scraps from today's lunch or dinner can be used to improve soil fertility in our home or backyard garden to make compost. 
Fill up to three quarters of a perforated container big enough to collect a week to a month's mixture of kitchen scraps, along with some dried leaves, grass, and dirt. Not everything should be composted. Turn the material thoroughly three days weekly for the first four weeks and thereafter every two weeks until there is no sign of vegetation but instead an odorless dark brown soil like material. The compost can be used in garden beds, flower pots, planters, etc. For further information, contact the St. Lucia Solid Waste Management Authority. In 2022, the government of St. Lucia, through the Development Control Authority, still approves large hotel developments stone throws away from the waterline. Hotels are allowed to build overwater suites, seemingly taunting Mother Nature, and private development continues unabated at the water's edge all around St. Lucia. Ironically, the same government of St. Lucia is cap in hand to various international agencies for climate mitigation funding. I have seen nothing, absolutely nothing, that suggests to me that any government in the last 15 to 20 years has factored in climate change in its decision making and its planning. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. It, it's as if the people who are speaking climate change are speaking in a particular forum, um, but they are not getting through to not just the people at the Development Control Authority or the people in the Ministry of Physical Development, but central government itself, cabinet itself, the Ministry of Tourism, the Ministry of, the Ministry of Responsibility for Investment. I don't know that any of that, any of that knowledge is permeating into these places because when you see the types of developments that, that are being approved, when you hear where they will take place and you think of, okay, what you know climate change and sea level rise will do, what you know that um, storm surge will, will impact. When you have of, of the possibility of mangroves being destroyed to put in marinas and you know that your mangrove is one of your serious important buffers, it is a buffer against sea level rise, it is a buffer against storm surge. Developing countries already saddled with debt must be given the means to be able to deal with climate change. We must act together to save our people and our planet. It is regrettable therefore that recent political differences between two of the biggest polluting countries have led to a halting of cooperation between them on climate issues. The future of our planet must never be held hostage to the politics of superpower rivalry. In, in Dominica, when Tropical Storm Erica hit, an entire community called Piti Savan was decimated and they had to relocate the people who lived in Piti Savan and put them somewhere else. We have communities in St. Lucia that will be very seriously impacted by climate change. So we need to start having that discussion. Should we now start looking at maybe relocating certain communities before, heaven help us, some calamity falls on us and, and people are now impacted and people lose their lives? That's the type of thinking, climate-informed thinking, that any government in the Caribbean, in any small island developing state, must embark on. But we cannot adapt without finance. We have to continue to lobby these developed countries that the monies that you promised that you would make available to us, you are morally obligated to make that money available to us and make it available to us within quick time because every year you delay in supplying us with these funds, that the ask, the demand becomes bigger. So maybe this year adaptation would have cost us $750 million next year, that same level of adaptation, in fact, it will be even more because so many other things have happened, it's now $1 billion. So the sooner you can make that money available to us, the quicker we can mitigate some of those impacts. Climate finance to frontline small island developing states declined by 25% in 2019. Failure to provide the critical finance and that of loss and damage is measured, my friends, in lives and livelihoods in our communities. This is immoral and it is unjust. I get annoyed every time I hear a Prime Minister from the Caribbean going out in an international forum and making noise and saying, we need money, we need money for climate change, we need money for, which we do, but not putting his or her own house in order to flood the Green Climate Fund, flood the Adaptation Fund, 
flood the Global Environment Facility with projects. Because you know what they come back and they say to us? Yes, Prime Minister, we've heard that you need money, but where are the projects? Where are the projects? You know, what do you have in front of our GCF, or our Adaptation Fund, where you've asked for maybe $250 million or $1 billion and we haven't given it to you? Just continue to whine and moan and saying, we need money, we need money. They will give you money, albeit a little bit slowly, but they will give you money if you flood them with projects. If I can leave with one big parting statement, it would be continue the lobby, intensify the lobby. Every single diplomatic avenue we have, intensify the lobby for financial and technical assistance. But please, please, please put our house in order. Get those units set up to develop these projects and flood those Green Climate Fund and Adaptation Fund and Global Environment Facility and FAO and WHO. Flood them with projects, well thought out, with properly budgeted projects showing the money that we need so that we can start mobilizing the finance that we require to be able to adapt. Otherwise, we'll be moaning and moaning and moaning and they'll come back to us and say, okay, what do you want? And we haven't shown what you want. So, you've watched this documentary and maybe thinking, these interviewees are all tree huggers. They're environmental alarmists, preaching from the doomsday gospel. You say the climate has always been changing and this sea level rise is nothing but Earth's regular cycle. Mother Nature is speaking loudly and humans are capturing her revolt on film for the elucidation of mankind. The onus is on the ones most at risk to continuously lobby the largest polluters to change their solid actions for the preservation of life as we know it. The climate is changing, present and continuous. So too must our actions, present and continuous, to secure mankind's future. Could go on and on, the fool has never been told. Could go on and on, the fool has never been told. Could go on and on, the fool has never been told.